the fucking airplane. Man on plane. These are live pictures uh, from the airport. The protester is James Brown. The view is better than a window seat, but don't expect meal service atop this British Airways flight at London City Airport. James Brown, a partially blind former Paralympic cyclist, clambered atop a British Airways plane after buying a ticket for so the flight, halting its departure. Okay, I'm, I'm streaming from um, London City Airport, and as you can see, um, there's a gentleman who's climbed on top of the plane. The average salary of people who fly out of here is a hundred, over a hundred thousand pounds a year. And the people who live locally only benefit through the pollution. This is a remarkable sight. Here we are at London City Airport. He was bound on the flight to Amsterdam. You can see uh, firefighters uh, there on top of the plane trying to help him down from the British Airways aircraft at London City Airport. The uh, former Paralympian and Extinction Rebellion uh, protester had climbed on top of the aeroplane. He said he hates heights, but I managed to get on the roof. This is all about the climate and ecological crisis. We're protesting against government inaction on climate and ecological breakdown. Making the impossible possible. It's all about what's possible, you know? And that, that actually ties in with my action at City Airport. It's all about possibilities. It's all about whatever you think might not be doable. Do you know what it possibly is? In order to, to, to tackle the climate crisis, the climate and nature crisis, and, and avert the worst impact, it's, it's happening. I mean, let's not, let's not beat about the bush. We are in a desperate situation. Um, and what we have to do is pull together, and we have to imagine something different, and we have to make massive change. That action was a demonstration of, um, I don't know, thinking differently, thinking independently, sort of um, pushing the boundaries. You know, I've always pushed boundaries. There must be something genetic in my kind of disposition, um, but there was definitely something in the way that my parents brought me up, especially my mum. Like, she took me out cycling on my first bike when I was seven on the roads. My mum was amazing, you know. I, I terrified her by learning to windsurf when I was 13 on one of the strongest waterways in the world. In Strangford Loch, you know, the, the tidal flow there is like nine or ten knots. Being a disabled person, I'm solving problems every day. When I go into the shop, I need to try and find something. I need to find the checkout. I need to deal with all of this new COVID stuff like bollards on the floor and lines and perspex screens, which means you can't see if there's anybody at a tail and you know. So you're constantly troubleshooting every day, all the time. Right, there's a bus coming, okay, what number is? Well I can't see it. I'm gonna have to find out another way of finding out what bus it is, you know. Um, and when I'm riding my, my mountain bike around here, okay, I know the tracks really well, but I have to be really careful and I just go through and I learn slowly. And then, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's just a matter of just constantly solving problems if you've got a significant disability, I guess. So I've got that mindset already and uh, I tend to be quite sort of curious about, you know, how to find solutions to things. My first uh, World Championship event was on cross-country skis when I was 17 and I'd only been skiing for a week. In 1984 I did both summer and winter Paralympics and uh, in the summer games I, you know, I was f fortunate enough to take golds in both 800 and 1500 and the world record in the eight. Um, and I kind of, you know, I just sort of thought that, that's my standard. I, you know, I, I guess it wasn't arrogance but it was sort of 
what's it's it's all about what's possible, you know. Fastest bike so far, as far as I know, and there's I think five more to come in. So just hope all of them don't beat us. You were flying out there incredibly quick. It felt really good, I have to say. You know, um, Damon handled the bike so well. It's a great bike, actually. Very pleased with the bike as well. And Sport-wise, yeah, I mean, I've sort of done sort of, um, yeah, sort of a, a reasonable level, sort of world championship level. I've done seven different disciplines. Alice Brown, daughter of James. I suppose I gained a certain world view from having my dad competing in the Paralympics. He was loving, he was... Uh, it's really fun just we just had so much fun some of the stories like still make me cry laughing today about the sort of things he did with us growing up i always remember knowing that my dad didn't sort of follow the same rules as everyone else so my dad uh, has a disability he's registered blind um, and and i'm sure that shaped his uh, first of all, how he understands the other people around him. It's very different, actually, to, ha to the sort of social cue cues and norms that we're used to. Um, but also, he always had a drive for, um, I guess, proving people wrong, to be honest, and that was in any sense. My fear for my kids is much greater than my fear for myself when I was sat on top of that plane. Um, and what was going through my mind? I think I said it all, you know, in the live stream and um, I, I, you know, I said this is for my kids, this is for all the kids. I also touch on inequalities, I think, in that live stream. That was definitely a big part of what I was feeling. I was feeling, I really felt it profoundly actually that day, that I was amongst privilege, I was amongst all of these wealthy people with you know, average salaries of in excess of, of £100,000. This is also in, inextricably linked with the crisis that we face, is, is inequality. It, it's, it, it, it's utterly inexplicable to me. It, it's baffling. Um, why do we need such inequality? We don't, actually, but why, why have we allowed it to, to, to exist? I, I think most human beings have a pretty sound heart. Um, I, I think we make mistakes when we get together in organisations. I think that's when things go wrong. And there's an awful lot of great work that's being done on how to run organisations in, in, eth in an ethical way and, you know, without, without these massive differences between the lowest and the highest paid. And so, yeah, I touched on that uh, on top of the plane. When I was maybe 22, 23, I started a geography course. Um, and I, so it was a mixture of physical geography and human geography. I started to learn about the sheer scale of the collapse of ecosystems. When I read that particular thing and, and everything around it about sort of insect Armageddon and uh, something, I can't describe it, I felt it rather than reading it. I really felt it and I, I would go as far as to say it was the beginning of being quite traumatised by the scale of the climate and ecological crisis and the humanitarian crisis. Um, so I shared this with my dad. I, I, I'm pretty late to this stuff, you know. Um, it was my daughter that, that woke me up. Um, my daughter and I met at Exeter train station. I was invited to go and give a talk at the, at the university. I specialise in social enterprise and the engineering department at the university is a few people in there who really get the, the stuff about why social enterprise is needed. And in fact, the, the, the title of the talk that day was Social Enterprise, Innovating to Save the Planet. And I was thinking, what, what's that about? I met my daughter that morning, she was coming to help me, and we had half an hour to kill in the station, and we sat down and I got some coffees. And she just, she just broke down crying. And I said, what's up with you, Alice? And, and she said, Dad, you know, I've been going on about this kind of nature thing that's going on that I've been studying for so long. She said, you really can't believe how bad it is. And she gave me some facts that she'd been reading that morning. And I thought, holy fuck. Um, it was uh, one of the South American countries and there was a, a study out just that day, you know, about something like 90, 98, 97 or 98% of 
um, ground dwelling insects had gone extinct within the past 10 years. And, and, and like, I wasn't a nature lover, but I'm a statistician. <laughs> and that was enough for me to go, oh my God, this stuff that I've been kind of vaguely aware of for the past years, is something I need to pay, pay attention to. But I think it wasn't the information that was uh, the initial hit. It was seeing the effect that it had on someone that he loved, that it's not usual to see someone react so emotionally to the news, really sadly, but it's true. And I don't know what it was about this that, that got me, but it did. Um, so we went and we carried on with the talk. Um, and I told him that day as well that there was, uh, there were some people that were planning to go and lie in the road in London. They'd put their first press release out and that day was the beginning of the whole thing. It was the declaration day and I hadn't gone to it. So I was really distressed because I thought there's nothing more important in the world right now than to go and be there with those people. Uh, and through explaining all of this to him, by the end of the weekend, he'd given me a call on the Sunday night and said, I get it, I'm coming with you. You know, and by what was it a few weeks later, we were on the bridges in Lambeth together, and it was emotional, and it was life changing, and it was um, direction changing. It was it, it was complete uh, personality and mind and soul changing, to be honest, for both of us and for everyone that was there. Six a.m., tenth of October, twenty nineteen. I woke up at six o'clock in the morning. I said, "Okay, I'm going to go to the airport. I'm going to." I'm going to do this. I'm going to. I'm going to make my contribution. So, I got on the train. I got the assistance that I always ask for uh, from the underground staff. I was handed over to a member of the overground train that went into the airport, um, and then met at, at the end of the track. And again, taken straight through security because I was carrying a white stick, holding onto the arm of somebody in a high vis. Um, taken straight to the check-in desk. I had to wait quite a long time downstairs actually by the doorway um, and luckily the door was looking straight out to the plane and it was about, it was only about sort of 25 metres away. 12 noon, City Airport, London. She said it's going to be a bit longer because the uh, cabin crew had been delayed by the protesters. I said, oh, bloody protesters, they're such a nuisance, aren't they? Um, she offered assistance and said, can I take your rucksack, Mr Brown? And I said, yes, please, um, because I need to climb on the, the, the roof of the plane for a moment and she just looked at me and within a couple of seconds you know I had I'd, I'd performed the maneuver and I was on top of the plane and I could just hear her as I was going up I could hear her hand go over her mouth you know the way somebody's voice changes when the hand when the hand goes over there goes, oh my god he actually did it 1 p.m. on top of a BA flight London to Amsterdam one foot on the hinge one hand on top of the door and it was straight up. I'd say most people could do it. So yeah, that was the start of it. That was the start of it. Um, and then there I was for whatever period of time I was there. Didn't, it didn't need lots of athletic prowess or strength. It was simply, you put your foot on one thing, you put your hand on something else and you pull you up. I, I sat first of all, um, because first of all, I couldn't believe that I actually pulled it off. And then I got my phone out and I started live streaming. I'd never done that before either. I hadn't even practiced. I didn't know how to. I can't see my screen. It was bright sunlight. I didn't have my glasses. <laughs> Somehow I managed to get the live stream to work. I can't work out to this day how I did that. I can't hide some shit in myself. I managed to get on the roof. Oh man, I'm so shaky. Um, I hope this is going out live. Um, so this is all about the climate and ecological crisis. We're protesting against government inaction on climate and ecological breakdown. They declare a climate emergency and then do nothing about it. In fact, they go the opposite direction. They sanction the expansion of airports, Heathrow, Bristol and others. I believe there's expansion of the city airport in London too. I believe at one point early in the live stream, I say to my phone, I'm thinking there was probably nobody listening to this, <laughs> you know, I'm holding it in front of me and I'm talking at it and I'm thinking, what an idiot. Um, and apparently at one point in the live stream, I say, well, um, 
I've never done a live stream before. Um, no idea if anybody's watching. Apparently, you know the way the comments come up, which again, I can't read. Apparently somebody goes, oh yeah, there's about 8,000 people watching it already and you've only been going a minute and a half. <laughs> but I only discovered that afterwards. Yeah. But then I got scared, you know, I did the live stream for, for I don't know how many minutes it was. I haven't even looked back. I'm really shitting myself. Um, I don't know if anybody's even watching this, so I've never done a live stream before. Uh, oh, it looks like there's some comments coming through, so fuck. Um, then I started to get scared. Ah, uh, sorry, it's got a bit dizzy there. Um, yeah. Oh, fuck. This is scary. We're at London City Airport. Um, James is a Paralympian um, from 2012 Olympics and he's bravely got on top of the plane today to um, highlight the government's inaction of reducing our carbon emissions. It's so serious. He's doing this for his children. He wept this morning when I did a little pre-record of what he was going to do. And I stopped the live stream um, and I turned around and just lay down on the plane then, you know. I guess the adrenaline was going away. So no, there's the, no other passengers on board. Um, James being um, partially sighted was the first one to be taken on board. And I've uh, had information that you've helped this gentleman to get on the plane, that you've given him a ticket to do so. So you're under arrest on suspicion of aiding and betting, endangering an aircraft and public nuisance. I'd only met James that day it was a scenario of if not me, then who could live stream that day. So I'd met him in the um, disabled bay and we'd had a hug and a bit of a chat and just wished each other luck. I went off to um, airside to uh, start streaming him and he got on the plane. I had people I didn't know contact me on Facebook and say I'm never going to fly again because of what you've done. There were two sisters from Germany who were in the plane beside the one that I was sat upon and they found me on Facebook and contacted me and they said we come to London fortnightly or monthly to visit our dad who's poorly. We're never going to fly again. We're going to come on the train. I also appreciate as a live streamer um, that our job is to share with the greater public what's happening and without that stream not everyone wouldn't have appreciated his extraordinary actions that day. I was contacted by a head of a private school in London who said he will never sanction a school trip that involves plane, plane travel. I worked in advertising for 30 years. I worked on many brands that now make me cringe because of what they're doing to our climate. And I've realised that since that day I want to focus on um, making our world a better place and not promoting consumerism. And James's action that day absolutely made me realise I need to quit and concentrate on climate activism. I got a pretty harsh response from some members of my family. Specifically family members, actually, rather than friends. I think friends if they see what you're doing and they go, no, I don't like that, they'll just ignore you then. But family members, it's a bit tighter and invariably you will hear from them, even if it's indirectly. So I had family members talking to other family members about why they didn't, why they didn't appreciate what I was doing and that it was embarrassing them and it was, I was bringing shame on the family. Um, and that was really, really hard really hard to deal with, to be honest. I'm not sure I still can deal with that. I think we think, we're brought up to think that we'll be all right, you know? We're brought up to think the government will look after us. I mean, they don't. They, they don't. They're not gonna look after us. They've proven that. Boris Johnson, you know, all this bluff and bluster about, you know, world leaders in tackling climate change and he flies to the fucking G7 in a fucking plane. And then he puts on a red arrows display. How arrogant is that? How can anybody take him seriously? How can anybody take Britain seriously when we do that shit? 
There's so many examples we could give. The bailouts, billions and billions of bailouts for fossil fuel industries, you know, through the pandemic. If my dad is found not guilty through this trial, I don't believe that any of these individual trials, you know, will be the breakthrough, to be honest, because the systemic problem is so deep. But I, I know that when you look back at history and you see that uh, this, this fight happened, justice was won, uh, this is what we have today. That process itself at the time was over 10, 20 years or so, you know. We can look back on history and say that's how it works, that's how change works, but I'm aware that this is one part of a huge battle that we still have to fight as people that are taking responsibility for the climate and ecological crisis. If he's found to be guilty, um, I don't think I'll be surprised in any way. Um, because we're fighting something, like I've said, we're fighting something really strong here. Um, and I think, it, it, to be honest, it's just more um, determination for us to just keep going. Like, there's everything to lose here, so there's also everything to gain by just carrying on the fight, so. I feel apprehensive about the court case, of course. Um, I'm charged with a pretty serious offence which could see me in prison for a long time. I believe there is no limit to the uh, prison sentence that, that can, be, can be handed down to somebody for public nuisance. There is, believe it or not, an actual offence specific, a bylaw specific to London City Airport, which says, effectively, thou shalt not climb on planes. I'm really, really hoping that I can make my case well to the jury and that they will get it, even if the judge doesn't. I think, I think I'm fortunate in that the, the judge who's presiding over my case is the same judge that presided over the uh, um, acquittal of the Shell 6. So I guess he's not, wanna gonna, he's not gonna wanna see another acquittal. Since understanding what is really going on in the world, um, I've been profoundly affected. I mean, I, I didn't know how badly I was affected, but you know, when I look back on a year ago, I, I couldn't even think 10 minutes ahead. I was just existing from one minute to the next. I, I wouldn't say I, was suicid I wasn't suicidal, but I didn't want to live either. It was a really weird, weird experience. I was just kind of existing in the middle of something. The support from others around me who are um, either involved in XR or not, really get the crisis and the extent of it the serious of it. And I'm really fortunate to be surrounded by many people who, who, who get it, who understand, who, who understand the extent and the seriousness and the speed. I think it's the speed, you know, actually, maybe that people don't get. I think maybe many get, oh yeah, it's really serious. And yeah, this stuff could happen. And oh yeah, it's 2100. But you know what? A lot of shit's going to be coming down the line much, much sooner than that that's going to affect them directly and their kids. We actually, as humans, can live in harmony with the planet and we don't have to destroy it. There's so much learning, man. There's so much to learn. There's so much to do. Um, yeah, and to do it together is just the most wonderful thing. If it wasn't for that, life would be unbearable. If it wasn't for the support and the, the camaraderie and... Yeah, it would be impossible. Verdict hearing, 28th of July, 2021. Judge Perry was really careful to close down um, James uh, Brown at every twist and turn to ensure that he did not use the defence of necessity, nor even imply it. Now, the c crucial thing is that I think that if um, a jury hears a defence of necessity, they're far more likely to accept it, they'll understand it and understand why we do what we do. So... I think that um, I was really astonished by the extent to which the judge really worked so hard throughout the three days to ensure that nothing mentioning necessity or even implying it uh, was put to the, uh, uh, the jury. So I think the lesson that people have to take from this is that we have to be more bullish and we have to be willing to push back against the judges um, and make it clear that we do act out of necessity. That is what this is all about. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, this... What Extinction Rebellion and people working in our movement are trying to do is the very definition of necessity. 
you know, climbing on top of a plane. You don't do that because you just fancy an afternoon out and doing some kind of extreme sport. James did that because he genuinely fears for the lives of his children and for the lives of everybody on this planet. He genuinely understands the science. That's why he took that extreme act. That is the very definition of necessity. And I don't think any member of our movement should ever let go of that. We're in the right and the judiciary are absolutely wrong. Let's keep pushing all the time. Don't give up on it. We act out of necessity. It's now only a couple of hours since the verdict. Uh, my initial thoughts when I came out were just that I was devastated. And I just thought, well, why do I do this? Why, why? Is it worth it? And I kind of still don't know. I don't, I don't know if, if these, I guess, sacrifices or whatever you want to call them, madnesses, you know, it was, it was a crazy thing to do. It was, it, but, you know, it's not the first crazy thing I've done in my life. Um, and I, I, you know, I, the, the, you know, the prosecution barrister was, was um, really pushing me hard on the, on, the, on the risk side of things. But, you know, we face a much bigger risk. And that's the risk that I'm highlighting. Um, so, relatively speaking, you know, I'm just one person. I took a risk with the legal system. Um, I don't know whether whether I can say whether I want to say that it went wrong. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I do, see. I just don't know what the outcome is going to be from this. And and. Like you say, there's there's loads of people who are out there challenging the system every day. And I just have so much respect for anybody who's prepared to put their liberty on the line for the future for the future of the planet and species, young people. Sentencing hearing, 24th of September, 2021. We're at Southwark Crown Court uh, this morning uh, for James Brown's sentencing hearing. He's already had to go into court this morning, just a little bit ahead of us, because he's uh, talking to his uh, lawyer about some inaccuracies that have appeared in the judge's summing up. Now, they've got to work through those and see what the implications of those are. So unfortunately, he's not going to be outside the court here today to talk to people in the media. Uh, so this is just a quick message to say there's a gang of us who are here to support him in court. Um, we are very worried about what the uh, sentencing outcome may be. Um, and we will know, uh, presumably, in a few minutes. The sentence is 12 months imprisonment. And so that means Jones must serve six months in prison, and a fine added of, I, I'm, I didn't quite catch everything that the judge said, but it could have been a fine or a costs order of £3,500. Now, we, 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 everybody in the public gallery was profoundly shocked by this. Um, there were tears in the gallery, the public gallery was full, um, and there were tears there, and people expressed their outrage. The judge just got up and walked out. And... Um, I think what is so, several elements to this are shocking. That is that James acted to protect life. He is a noble man. Fundamentally, he did what he did to try and save millions, potentially billions of people's lives. And so now he's going to spend six months in prison, a man who is partially sighted, partially sighted since birth, and subject to being exploited in prison. How is he supposed to defend himself in terms of what prison life is like? Um, he is a vulnerable man. And the judge pretends that he is otherwise. Uh, I think, I, you know, all of us are absolutely outraged. There's one other act of cruelty involved in this, which is that James is partially sighted and he was struggling to hear what was said in court. Um, and, he, and he was behind glass panels and he had to press his ear up against a tiny gap between glass, two glass panels to hear what was being said. It was so cruel and inhuman. Um, so I was outraged and upset by the actual process in court, but particularly upset by the sentence. I, 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 I don't know what else to say. I'm just profoundly shocked by what's happened in court. Uh, we all are here today. 
We're all desperately upset by this. It's so unfair that a man like James should be committed to prison for six months. And he, his crime, ultimately, is to try and save people's lives. It's an outrage. Judge Gregory Perrins claimed James cynically used his disability and put his own life at risk. James Brown is the first Extinction Rebellion protester to receive a custodial jail sentence. We are the song upon the wind. We are the courage to stand forth. We are the change that now begins. On this good green earth, we will take a stand with an open heart and a healing hand. We are the tongue that speaks the truth. We are the song upon the wind. We are the courage to stand forth. We are the change that now begins. On this good green earth, we will take a stand with an open heart and a healing hand. We are the tongue that speaks the truth. We are the song upon the wind. We are the courage to stand forth. We are the change that now begins. On this good green earth, we will take a stand With an open heart and a healing hand With an open heart and a healing hand